welcome to today's show, Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, passionate, inspirational speaker, author, poet, and entrepreneur. Welcome to Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. I'm delighted that you joined me. I want to give a great big thank you to those of you listening in today. I also want to give a great big shout out to all of you listening all around the world. I'm delighted and so grateful that you tuned in. I sure hope you're enjoying a fabulous day today and that you're having a fantastic week. Because you know what? In the grand song of the universe, life is very, very short. It's short and sweet and oh so precious. So... I hope you're making a difference in your own life, because when you do, you also make a difference in someone else's life. Now, a lot of us, a lot of folks really want to make their life count for something, but they don't know quite how to do it, and it seems so big to them that they don't even know where to begin. So they ask me, Dr. Gloria, how do you do that? How do you make your life count? Well, it's really very simple, very, very simple. You make your life count day by day, step by step, moment by moment, every single day, 365, 24-7. You make your life count by being there for somebody who needs the sweet fragrance of your presence, by the simple loving things that you do for someone or say to someone by being an encourager, by being an uplifter. Maybe it's by making dinner or maybe buying flowers (laughs) or running a warm bath for your wife or husband just because. By being grateful for who you are, being grateful for family and friends, and counting your blessings. Now that's just nine or ten different ways to make your life count. It doesn't have to be written in headlines across the sky, does it? You can make your life count just by doing the simple things, the small things, the things that will move someone else's heart. That's what legacy living, make your life count, is all about. You can learn more about legacy living, make your life count, by visiting the Gloria Burgess website. That's Gloria Burgess, G-L-O-R-I-A, B as in boy, U-R-G-E-S-S dot com. Just take a look around the website and, you know, notice a few of the things that, uh, that are on there and you'll get a better sense of who I am and what Legacy Living is all about. Now that's the Gloria Burgess website, G-L-O-R-I-A, B as in boy, U-R-G-E-S-S dot com, or by visiting Facebook at facebook.com forward slash dr for Dr. Dr. Gloria Burgess, Ph.D. forward slash. All right. Today's show is in honor of a wonderful, a wonderful poet and author, Lucille Clifton. She's an incredible writer and an amazing human being. Now, as many of you know, during the month of February in the United States, we celebrate Black History Month, or Black Heritage Month, as we sometimes call it. Well, you know me. I like to celebrate the lives of African Americans, the soulful music of black lives, every single day, (laughs) not just the 28 days in February. Every single day, 365, 24-7. So who is, who is Lucille Clifton? Well, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, she's an incredible poet, and she's also an amazing human being. I had the privilege and the honor of meeting Ms. Clifton, not once, but several times. I first met her at the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival, which is held every other year on the East Coast. I also met her at the Skagit River Poetry Festival, which is also held every other year. Now, these are sister poetry festivals, the Dodge Festival and the Skagit Festival, and these two celebrations are actually held on alternate years. 
Now, when I first met Miss Lucille, I was struck. I was struck by how ordinary she was. Now, I don't mean ordinary in a negative kind of way, not at all. I actually mean it as a very high compliment. Lucille was ordinary in the way she looked, the way she walked, (laughs) the way she spoke, the tilt of her head, even the language she used, the words she used to introduce her poems. And the words she used in her poems spoke to me. They spoke to my core. Just as clearly as an elder in my personal village would speak words of wisdom to me, the just right-sized pearls that I could tuck into my pocket and take with me wherever I happened to go. From Lucille's words, I could, I could actually imagine the street she lived on, the house she lived in, the people she lived with, even the food she might have cooked for those people, her people. <laughs> her people were also my people. I could relate to Lucille as if she were one of my own, one of my own neighbors, one of my own aunties, one of my own sisters even, right? Why? Because she was, she was one of my own. Lucille was the kind of person I love to meet and I love to write about the kind of person who who dares, (laughs) who dares to be fully and completely who they are, inside and out. So, in her honor, today's focus is dare to be you. Dare to be you. Now, before I dive into today's show, I want to pause for just a moment to welcome you, to welcome you, my listeners. If you're just joining us, I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. This is Legacy Living, Make Your Life Count. And I'd like to extend a very special welcome to those of you who are joining my show, or if you're joining Talk Network Radio for the very first time. Let me tell you, (laughs) you are in for a real treat. I'm excited to have you listening in today, and I'm deeply honored that you've allowed me to be part of your day so you can be inspired by the ideas and resources to make your life count. Now, once again, today's topic is Dare to Be You, and my focus today is to pay tribute, to pay homage to Ms. Lucille Clifton as we lift up this prolific poet, and writer. Now, the best way to introduce Lucille Clifton is not through the lens of the many awards and prizes and and honorary degrees she earned, or where she taught, or even how many books she wrote, books of poetry and books for children. Oh, no. (laughs) The best way to introduce Lucille Clifton is through her own words, through her own poems, I remember that whenever I heard her read, she seemed to really enjoy reading one of her best-known poems. Some of you may may know it. It's called Homage to My Hips. Homage to My Hips. These hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. These hips have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go. (laughs) They do what they want to do. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and spin him like a top. (laughs) I just love this poem for so many reasons. I'm going to read it again. Homage to my hips. These hips are big hips. They need 
space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. These hips have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go. (laughs) They do what they want to do. These hips. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and spin him like a top. Mm. Ah, I just love Lucille and uh, how she takes just a handful of words and makes incredible music and magic out of those words. I love this particular poem. It explores the body, a woman's body, in ways that we're not supposed to talk about all the time, right? And certainly not in public. At least, not when this poem was written. On another layer, this poem also addresses the body, the black body, not as a thing, not as an object, not as something that was owned by another human being. Here, Clifton lifts up the body as as liberated and luscious, not as an object, mind you, but as an embodied aspect of womanhood and as someone who had stepped away from an identity of being owned, of being enslaved. Another one of my favorite poems by Miss Lucille is called Slave Ships. Slave Ships. In this poem, she calls the name of several slave ships that were used during the Middle Passage. Now, often the ships were named using Christian images and words from Scripture. And for those of you who may not know what the Middle Passage is, it's actually a term that we use that refers to a specific part of what is sometimes called the triangular route of the slave ships. So imagine a triangle, okay? Imagine a triangle, and the points of the triangle point to the geography of the slave trade. So at the top, you know, that very first point of the triangle at the top, uh, we would refer to what is now known as the UK, the United Kingdom, okay? And then the second point of the triangle points down to the west coast of Africa, all right? And then this point of the triangle um, crosses over, okay, to the third point, uh, and that geography is known as the Americas, North America, Central America, and South America. These were the destination points for the African people who were enslaved. So the Middle Passage is the name that we give to the middle part of the triangle, the part where the slave ships crossed the Atlantic Ocean from uh, from Africa to the Americas. So Lucille says this about her poem, Slave Ships. She says, this is a poem about ships that went from the African continent and took free people and brought them to this continent where they were enslaved. Now, she goes on to say, I did not say (laughs) that this was about ships that went to Africa and got slaves and brought them here. And there is a difference if you can feel it. Now, I noticed these names of slave ships, and I wanted to write about it. One of the ships was called Jesus. One was called Angel. And another was called Grace of God. So here's her poem, Slave Ships. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus, where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing. Jesus, 
Why do you not protect us? Chained to the heart of the angel. Where the prayers we never tell. And hot and red as our bloody ankles. Jesus, angel. Can these be men? Who vomit us out from ships called Jesus, angel, grace of God, onto a heathen country, Jesus, angel, ever again can this tongue speak, can these bones walk grace of God can this sin live Mercy. What do you say after a poem like that? Again, it's amazing what Lucille can do with just a just a handful of words, a handful of ordinary words that she transforms into the extraordinary. In his beautiful poem Asphodel, William Carlos Williams says this, It is difficult to get the news from poems. It is difficult to get the news from poems, though men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. This little gem about the news you can find inside poems is is tucked deep inside of that poem, Asphodel. Lucille's poems remind me that inside of every poem is a bit of news. News that shines the light on what it means to to be human. Before her death, in February 2010, Clifton was a distinguished professor of humanities at St. Mary's College of Maryland. She also taught at Columbia University. Born in Depew, New York in 1936 to working class parents, Lucille attended Howard University before She turned 17 years old. She was actually 16 when she enrolled. Although she was given the name Thelma when she was born, as a young woman, she changed her name to Lucille. Her given name of Thelma was also her mother's name. Like Lucille, her mother was also a writer, a poet in her own right, whose gifts were unfortunately thwarted. In her poem called Fury, Fury, Clifton captures the essence of her mother's experience. For Mama, Fury. Remember this. She is standing by the furnace. The coals glisten like rubies. Her hand, her hand is crying. Her hand is clutching a sheaf of papers. Poems. She gives them up. They burn jewels into jewels. Her eyes are animals. Each hank of hair is a serpent's obedient wife. 
she will never recover. Remember, there is nothing you will not bear for this woman's sake. Lucille Clifton's father and her mother had an elementary school education. And (laughs) her mother was also a poet, a poet with a burning desire to write. In Lucille's own words, she says, once my mother got a letter from somebody who wanted to put her poems in a book. And my father wouldn't let her do it. Now, now you frown because, what? You know. (laughs) Now she's talking here to Bill Moyers who's interviewing her, okay? She continues, but let me tell you something. In the 40s and 50s, husbands thought they could do that. Sometimes guys still try that now, okay? (laughs) It's not going to work for you, you know? And so what my mother did was take her poems and she burned them. She put them in a cold stove. And I was standing on the steps leading down into the cellar when she did that. And this poem, Fury, this is a poem, and I understand. I remembered that I understand what fury and anger were. Now, again, this is Lucille talking to Bill Moyers. He was interviewing her for his his wonderful gem of a book called The Language of Life. This book is all about poets, poetry, and the craft of using language to reflect life, to give us a window into, into life, into humanity. Lucille's poem is very, very powerful. It is a poem that pays homage to her mom. It's also a poem that uses a few well-chosen words, like all of Clifton's poems do, and in those few words, those few lines of poetry, is this magnificent story told in miniature. This poet is so, so at the top of her craft, She can convict us all in just a few short lines. And at the core of this this last poem, at the core, this poem paints a vivid picture of her mom throwing her poems into into that batch of coals, into the fiery furnace. But at the core of this poem are words and images. It's a story about loyalty. Now, for Thelma Sayers, it's about her poems, her creativity, and it's also about her loyalty, about her loyalty, her steadfastness to being a woman who accepted her husband's wishes. Now, for us, maybe it's about loyalty to to work, or loyalty to the past, or to a place, or to a friendship, or to a lifestyle, perhaps. Maybe it's our loyalty to our friends or a relationship that no longer nourishes us. Maybe it's work that no longer feeds us. Or maybe it's loyalty to a way of living, a way of being, a way of moving through the world that no longer serves us. Now, what we don't often recognize is that on the other side of loyalty is disloyalty. Okay, let me repeat that. (laughs) What we don't often recognize is that on the other side of loyalty is disloyalty. What do I mean by that? Well, often in order to be loyal to something or someone or how we move through the world, we have to give up something. We have to surrender something, don't we? We have to be disloyal to someone or something else in order to be loyal. 
Now, many of us are disloyal to our own creativity. I just spoke with a woman this morning who called me. She said, Gloria, I need some mentoring time. I need some mentoring time. And what the conversation was all about was disloyalty. Being disloyal to our own creativity. And when we are, the consequence is that we're disloyal to our own creative juices, our own creative life. When we're loyal to someone or something else, we often become disloyal to what has heart and meaning for us. Here's the thing. We form habits, well-intentioned habits, that make us obedient to one thing, a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of being, a spouse or a partner, our children sometimes, right? And in so doing, we don't even realize the big price tag that goes along with that choice. So what is the price we pay? The price we pay is being stuck. Being stuck in old ways of thinking, in unhealthy relationships, and work that we have outgrown. We stay stuck in old, worn-out habits and routines that no longer fit us that no longer provide oxygen for us, habits and routines that no longer serve us. Now, that's a different show. (laughs) I know, right? Now, back to Lucille. One of the many things I just love about Lucille that I just adore about her is her uncanny ability to recognize the extraordinary in what others would see as ordinary. She actually sees in a particular way. And she goes the extra mile through her curiosity and then through her writing. That's what artists do. (laughs) That's what poets do. That's what musicians do. That's what sculptors do. They go the extra mile. They see in a very particular way, and then they go the extra mile through their curiosity and whatever art form they're working in. So by seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary, Lucille makes a difference every single day in her poems, and in her children's books. This next poem is one that came out of Lucille's experience of visiting a plantation. Visiting a plantation in South Carolina. Now for me, her experience and what she pours into the poem is all about, is all about seeing. All about seeing. And I just love how she reflects on an ordinary experience that most of us would just take as a given. We just kind of take it for granted, going on, you know, a plantation tour, right? But not Lucille. She senses into her experience and is curious and as furious as a terrier with a bone, she unearths and treasures, unearths and treasures what is quite extraordinary. This next poem is called At the Cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989. At the Cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989. Among the Rock At Walnut Grove, your silence drumming in my bones. Tell me your names. Nobody mentioned slaves, and yet the curious tools shine with your fingerprints. Nobody mentioned slaves. But somebody did this work who had no guide, no stone, who molders under rock. 
Tell me your names. Tell me your bashful names, and I will testify. The inventory lists ten slaves, but only men were recognized. Among the rocks, at Walnut Grove, some of these honored dead were dark. Some of these dark were slaves. Some of these slaves were women. Some of them did this honored work. Tell me, your names, foremothers, brothers. Tell me your dishonored names. Here lies, here lies, here lies, here lies, here. Lies. here. A prolific and widely respected poet and writer, Lucille Clifton's work emphasizes endurance and strength and resilience through adversity. Because she focuses on African American experience and life, and because she is so particular in that focus, her work is universal in its appeal and its impact. That's what good poetry does. So particular in its focus that it becomes universal, universal in its appeal and its impact. In fact, as they awarded the prestigious Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize to Clifton about 10 years ago, the judges said, one always feels the looming humaneness around Lucille Clifton's poems. It is a moral quality that some poets have and some don't. As I mentioned earlier, Lucille left this earth about seven years ago. On February 13th, 2010, Lucille Clifton died. I, for one, could not believe it. (laughs) I didn't want to believe it. My fellow poet and writer, my sister friend, who, when asked about the craft of poetry, would craftily tell you stories instead. (laughs) My sister friend passed on. After a long struggle with cancer, she crossed over to the other side. About two weeks later, Bill Moyers wrote a fitting tribute to her life and her work. Here's what Moyers wrote. He says, The long arc of morality, the long arc of morality that bends towards justice, leads not only through the courthouse and the state house, but out on the streets and in the pages of poetry and prose. Luckily for the rest of us, There are writers who, in words both beautiful and bold, can express rage at injustice. But they don't stop there. They help us experience sorrow and joy through an intimate knowledge of tempestuous human nature. We lost 
one of those gifted people the other day. One of our most popular poets, my friend, Lucille Clifton. Lucille Clifton's poetry, legendary for its sparseness of word and punctuation, spoke unflinchingly of personal hardship, the history of oppression, and the human condition. She was a standout in several programs, we, meaning PBS, in several programs we produced over the years on the wonders of poetry. Lucille Clifton learned to love language as a child, listening to poems written by her mother, a woman who never finished grade school. Inheriting that love of language and the spirit of her mom, Lucille Clifton wrote poetry of her own 20 years before she was actually published. But with her first collections of poems, she quickly gained recognition that just kept growing over time. Over a long and prolific career, Clifton published more than 30 books that probed the indignations of slavery, celebrated the day-to-day events of life and community, and chronicled with frank and poignant sensuality the fragilities, the frailties, and pleasures of the human body. Lucille Clifton was a two-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in the same year, something that had never happened before. In 2000, she received the National Book Award for her book of poems called Blessing the Boats, New and Selected Poems. And then in 2007, she became the first African-American woman to receive the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, one of America's um, most prestigious poetry honors. Lucille Clifton was 73. Thank you, Bill Moyers, for that amazing, amazing tribute. I'll share one final poem with you today by Lucille Clifton, one of my favorites, as we lift her up today in honor of Black History Month, a very special month when we celebrate the accomplishments, the achievements, the mighty road that blacks have journeyed. And you know, I like to celebrate black history, not only during the month of February, but every single day, 365, 24-7. This poem is fittingly called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Miss Lucille, we lift you up and celebrate you. We celebrate you each and every single day. Thank you for teaching us how to dare. To dare to be you. Now, if you missed any part of today's broadcast, You can listen to the recording at your own convenience. You can listen to it on the go. How about that? (laughs) Check us out at www.talknetworkradio.com forward slash legacy living. That's www.talknetworkradio.com forward slash 
Legacy Living, L-E-G-A-C-Y-L-I-V-I-N-G, all smushed together in one word. Before I close today, I want to thank each of you for tuning in to today's show, for allowing me to share a bit of my journey with what Legacy Living is all about. Not just living and learning, but living and learning and serving so that you make a difference in your own life and in the lives of others. It's all about being on purpose every single day, 365, 24-7. Legacy living is one of the many ways to make your life count. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess, and this has been Legacy Living Make Your Life Count. Please join me again next week right here on Talk Network Radio for another show of Legacy Living Make Your Life Count. Don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what Legacy Living is all about. Have a fantastic day, and remember, make the days of your life count. God bless. That's our show today. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Burgess. I hope you'll join me again next week. Until then, don't just count the days in your life. Make the days in your life count. That's what Legacy Living is all about. Here's to you. Have a fantastic day. Be sure to make it a yes kind of day. And remember, celebrate. Celebrate the music of your life. Make the days in your life count.